Dr. Watson has arrived at the brothel. I must say, it's quite scandalous for him to be in a place like this. He is a married man and a gentleman. If you'd be patient, Madam Bella will arrive in a moment. <laughs> Madam Bella runs this establishment. Good evening, I am Dr. Watson. It is young Lucy who told me to come see you. Ah, so you're the good Samaritan who saved her uncle without asking for anything in return. And now you've come to see me, no doubt, to explain that the poor little thing doesn't belong here and you will see to her future. Well, if you expect me to let her leave with you... <laughs> it's not that, ma'am. Uh, you should know I am a married man. And why should that matter? He's not going to run away with some other woman when he's happily married. Thank you very much. He barely knows Lucy, anyway. <laughs> anyway, I, I came here to ask about Leather Apron. I believe there has been a misunderstanding. The reason that Lucy sent me here is that you may be able to give me some information about Leather Apron. Are you a doctor or a constable? I am most certainly a doctor but I am acting in this matter in a private capacity, and I would like to find this man. Well, if you're able to rid us of him, I'll give you a week's worth of free passes. That man is a thorn in our sides. He spies on the girls in the streets and watches them inside the houses, spying through the windows. And as soon as they're finished with a client, he jumps on them without any warning and forces them to give him their money. I've never seen him, but one of my girls was attacked by this man and she said that he wore a leather apron and carried a knife. And his face, oh, he has a horrible head with rat's eyes and a deformed mouth. She even said that she knew his name, um, Pizer or Pizer, I think. But I don't know where she can be found. Margie Nutcracker, the girl I'm talking about, could tell you more, but I had to let her go last week. Okay, that is somewhat useful. The first part of her explanation was not useful. Where the leather apron? He wears a leather apron! Like, I knew that already, but uh, Margie will tell us more. So good, we have, a, we have a witness. Why did you let Margie go? The poor girl caught a shameful sickness, and the symptoms have attacked her face, if you know what I mean. So I gave her notice, and a little bit to help her along. I don't know where she is now, but she'll certainly be getting treatment at the clinic if she's still in the neighbourhood. Did you speak to the police? <sighs> What would they do? Who cares about the girls in the streets? All right, she is in the hospital. And speaking of hospital, there are doctors in hospitals. We're trying to find Dr. Tumblety. Would you have received a visit from another doctor, a stranger by the name of Tumblety? I'm just like you, doctor. Sworn to secrecy in my profession. But as I've taken a fancy to you, I can tell you that this name is not unknown to me. And if you do me a little favour, it is possible I might remember something about him. All right, what do you need me to do? <clears throat> uh, what kind of favour must I do for you? You see that man over there? He's a rich artist, a painter, a regular client round here. Well, yesterday, he came and left his cane in the umbrella stand in the hall before going into one of the rooms. But when he returned to this room, the cane had disappeared. It's a cane with a massive silver knob. Must be worth a fortune. He threatened to call the police unless he got free services in my establishment for a year. I'll be forced to accept, unwillingly, of course, given the services that he's demanding, unless the cane is found. Can I get a so what exactly happened? Did you question the residents regarding the theft? They didn't see anything, and there's not one of them that would risk stealing from a client here. Who was in the room when your weasel of a client was in the chambers? There were a few that came and went, but Mary could tell you better than I can, because she was the one at the counter yesterday. All right. Thank you, ma'am. No problem, my angel. Angel? Oh, I, I barely know you, madam. What happened to this rug? Oh, it's when we got a coal yesterday. I asked the young man to fill the pail, 
He came back to put it down, but his feet were covered in soot and he made a black print. Madame Bella said it was my fault and I got a shilling's penalty. I also have to clean the print and it's no picnic. He has immense feet, that boy. All right. I heard that there was a theft yesterday. Did you see anything? No, and I was here the whole time. All righty. Who delivers the coal? It's never the same person. I've never seen that lad before. Do you always keep an eye on the coat stand? Oh, yes. Well, when the coal delivery came, a client came out of the chambers and stopped me from seeing the boy who brought the bucket of coal. You don't think he would have taken advantage? Hmm, yeah, I think so. Until next time, miss. With pleasure, sir. This 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 mystery coal man who made a big mess is definitely one of our suspects. A large black footprint. And we can't go into any of these other rooms. Best not to stray off in that direction. Like you can hear the kissing, they're like mm. And then then the people um Best not to stray off in that direction. alcohol and laughing. Let's leave them alone. Yes, yes. And we want to talk to this man as well. There's the coat. I think that's the coat rack. It's hard to see, isn't it? But yes, we'll talk about him. He is the victim of the crime. Good evening, sir. Good evening, my dear man. I was led to believe that you're a doctor. None of the residents of this establishment are among my patients, sir. Oh, you're not here as a doctor, but as a man, then. I understand. This is my kind of place, too. It's in these houses in Whitechapel that you find the girls that are the most natural and definitely the most docile. Your way of speaking about these women is not that of a gentleman, sir. Yes, you are definitely not a gentleman. I heard that you were the victim of a robbery here. Oh, I'm not complaining. The loss of that walking stick will certainly bring me a very pleasant compensation. So can you tell us more about the missing cane? What does your cane look like? The stick is ebony, about 35 inches long. The round knob is made from chiseled silver with a ring around the middle of the same workmanship, just like the tip for that matter. If you find it, don't tell a soul. Keep it for yourself, got it? All right. Well, goodbye, sir. Goodbye, or until next time, and good evening. <laughs> So we are going to find the cane. That's sort of why he gave us such a long description. We have a puzzle finding the cane. It's here at the clinic. And we had to go to the clinic anyway, right? That's where Margie is. So we'll, we'll do two things at once. We'll find a cane and... Here's the proof, by the way. These footprints are the same as those found on the rug at the brothel. Yes, the thief left those telltale footprints. And the cane is inside here. It looks like we can't open it quite yet. Perhaps we need to speak with Dr. Gibbons first. Good evening, Doctor. My name is Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you. Good evening. I am Dr. Gibbons. Likewise. So... What about the footprints? Pardon me, Doctor, but who made the large black footprints there, near the beds? The brother of one of my patients. The poor thing had a leg amputated after colliding with a carriage. We arranged to find her a prosthesis. Prostheses are very expensive. How did this man pay? He told me that one of his uncles gave him a walking stick with a chiselled silver knob. I agreed to accept this knob in exchange for a simple prosthesis with harness. But this object is of great value, and I could finance half a dozen other prosthesis by selling it on Petticoat Lane. Hmm, yeah, that's because the cane was stolen. You got duped, sir. Doctor, I have reason to believe that the silver knob that you possess is from a cane that was stolen by the man who brought it to you. And I believe I know to whom it belongs. That's what I was worried about. The story of the uncle seemed a little strange. Nevertheless, you must have proof of what you claim. I will show you all of the knobs that we have here. If you find the knob that the young man gave me, I will believe you. Excellent, we can do that. So be it, but something is bothering me. I will need a complete cane, not just a knob. 
Don't worry, dear chap, build one. I can loan you some tools. Make use of the odds and ends in my cupboard. It'll help get rid of it. Hmm, well, I shall try. I will have to remember the description that Sickert gave. Goodbye, Dr Gibbons. Until we meet again, my dear colleague. Ask about Margie after finishing the cane, because we want to remember the description, which was in the dialogues here. So, it's ebony, 35 inches long, round knob made of chiseled silver with a ring around the middle, the same workmanship, just like the tip for that matter. So now we can open up this and solve the puzzle. Where is it? Over here? It's the left-hand side of the cabinet. Alright, so ebony is clearly this one. It's about 35 inches. No, that's like 70 inches. Um, okay, maybe he counts it double. I don't know. Um, very fancy silver top. We know that. That's that's the fanciest silver top, right? These other silver tops, not as fancy. So we want something that matches it. That clearly matches, and then the tip clearly matches. There. All done. Holmes couldn't have done better himself. What can I do for you, my dear colleague? Well, what do you think about my cane? I believe I found the knob from the stolen cane, which I succeeded in putting back together. That's the one. And yet I cannot give it to you, Doctor. I will only return it to the police, and only if there is an official complaint against me. Would there be a way to convince you to give me the cane? Find me a dozen solid, adjustable harnesses for wooden leg prostheses, and it's yours, Doctor. Really? Really? Come on, Dr. Gibbons. That is a really slimy request to make. I have come to see you about one of your patients. Margie goes by the nickname Nutcracker, who gets her prescription from the clinic. She's a lady of the night and is afflicted with a venereal disease. I know who you're talking about. Indeed, Margie has syphilis and is being treated with mercury. Do you have her address? No. And for your information, she left London for good three days ago. She felt threatened. Oh man. She was our only witness for Leather Apron. Margie felt threatened. But by who? I believe that Margie was particularly scared of a terrifying man who attacked her once. Did she say the name Pisa or Pytha? Unfortunately, she didn't give a name, but she described a man with shifty, rat-like eyes and a mouth twisted in a sinister grimace. Mm -hmm. That is definitely Leather Apron. Did Margie have any idea where this man who terrified her so much might be found? No, but she told me that another girl who'd been attacked like her had told her that this man worked in a cobbler's run by an old Israeli. Also, she saw him again last week, the night of the big fire. She told of going to see the fire like most everyone else in the area. While there, she recognised her attacker in the crowds gathered at the warehouses. There was no mistake in a face like that, she said. She kept an eye on the man the whole time the firemen were working in order to avoid him. Hmm, interesting. Goodbye, Dr. Gibbons. Until we meet again, my dear colleague. So that fire was the same night that Polly was murdered. It sounds like Leather Apron was there watching the fire and not murdering Polly. Therefore, Leather Apron must be innocent. This interview with the doctor revealed an important fact. Leather Apron could not be the Bucks Row murderer. According to Margie, the villain passed most of the night of the crime at the fire. He could not have been at the scene of the murder at the moment it was committed. He is nonetheless a dangerous character. He's still a dangerous character, and therefore I will still be trying to find him. But he's innocent. Doesn't matter. We're still going to try to find him. So we got the clue that Leather Apron works for the Jewish cobbler. He is right over here. There's nobody here. How very odd. Now the Jewish cobbler is here. Previously he was not. Previously we couldn't go inside his house. So let's see what's this on the desk. I say, these things look like harnesses. Oh my, they are noisy. 
Good evening, sir. Pardon the interruption. The door was open. I didn't think that I would find anyone working at this hour. Good evening, sir. I didn't hear you come in. So, what's up with these harnesses? Say, those things that made noise, they are really harnesses, aren't they? Yes, horse harnesses. But I must tell you, sir, that the store is normally closed at this hour. That is why I've asked you to return tomorrow. I didn't come about my shoes. I came to speak of a cobbler, perhaps one of your former employees, a man with very particular habits. You aren't with the police by any chance. I'm sorry, but I do not want to speak of anything but shoes with you. Oh, yeah, this guy really doesn't want to talk to me. But hey, we have a friend in common, Finley. I am not a policeman. I am Dr. Watson. It's Mr. Finley who told me that you might be in a position to inform me. Ah, that Mr. Finley is a very brave man. And if he sent you, then you must certainly be a worthy man also. So, Doctor, who is this cobbler with strange habits? Well, it's Pizer or Pyther, and he wears a leather apron, and he's been attacking women. The man of whom I speak is called Pizer or Pyther, a man with a frightening face. Do you know him? Yes, John Pizer. He worked here for a while, but he is no longer here. So where is he now? Do you know where I can find him? No, and if you look, you will not find him. Why? Because he is in hiding, Doctor. You see, a week ago, a horrible murder took place in the neighborhood. A rumor circulated that he might have been responsible for this crime. They say he has quarreled with women of certain virtue in the past, if you understand me. Isaac, it is about the Bucks Road case that I have come to see you. I have the certitude and an incontestable witness that Pizer is innocent, at least of this crime, although he has attacked a number of street women. If he doesn't come forward to explain himself to the authorities, he is condemned to hiding and to take the fall for this murder. Furthermore, it will cast suspicions on your community because they must be hiding him. And while the whole police force is hunting for him, they cannot concentrate on the real assassin who roams the streets and, one never knows, may take any one of you any day. If what you say is true, your visit is a godsend to our community, Doctor. I tell you something. I know Sergeant Thick, an honest policeman who lives in the area. I'll tell John's family that he must go there to explain himself. But if you could please go as soon as possible to the police to give them this report that you say is incontestable. I will go as soon as I take leave of you. Thank you. If I can ever be of service in any way, do not hesitate to ask. Well, actually, there is a way you can help me. Could we transform your horse harnesses into harnesses for wooden legs? Adjustable harnesses. A good craftsman can do anything, Doctor. And I do believe that's what I am. Come back in a while and it will be done. That will be my thanks for what you have done. Great. I shall return later. At your convenience, sir. Ah, oh, I am spent. I would like to return home. But I promised to go to the police as soon as I could. Now then, let's go to the police station. So at some point later we'll we'll return to him. He will give us the he will give us these processes which we can give to Dr. Gibbons in exchange for the cane, which we can give to Madame Bella, and then she'll tell us... What is she going to tell us? I've already forgotten. It's been so long. Let's see. So she... Uh, oh, she's going to tell us how to find Dr. Tumblety. That's it. That's it. So that's what all this is for. This is all finding Dr. Tumblety because that's what our buddy Finley said, and of course, Finley is the most trustworthy, honorable man in the history of London. Let's talk to him. What do you want, Doctor? Ah, uh, wow, there's nothing good to talk to him about. He's just standing there, staring at me vacantly. Thank you, Finley. At your service, sir. All right, sir. All right, let's go to the police station, then, and bring an end to this... Long investigation of Dr. Watson's. Police 
station right over here. Run, 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 Dr. Watson, run! There we go! Meanwhile, Jack the Ripper is claiming another victim. Oh dear. Ah, and there's this woman. She's a witness. Will you? Yes. That will be important. We're gonna make a timeline of, uh, Hey, Doctor, the you seem tired. Were you wandering the darker parts of Whitechapel all night? You could say that. I have some information on Leather Apron, the man of whom we spoke earlier. Do you know where he is? No, but I can clear him of the Bucks Row crime. A witness proved him totally innocent. Oh, Watson, Watson, is it only now, after many hours of walking, that you decide to pass on the important message that Inspector Abilene is waiting for? But, um, no. But what are you doing here, Holmes? I was worried, Watson, and with good reason it would appear. Go give the message to this policeman and let's go home. Nobody appreciates me hanging around here, you know, and it's freezing cold. Ah, Creddle, none too soon. You will take the testimony of this... No, you continue with your duty shift. I must find Chowder in Ambry Street. He's struck again. Who? The murderer. The Bucks Row assassin. Jack the Ripper. Ambry Street. Let's go, Watson. We have no time to lose. All right. So, by coincidence, we just happen to be here when the police learn there's been another murder. So that way, Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes will be there. Ambry Street. Let's go, Watson. We have no time to lose. Yeah, just like less than two hours after the murder, our heroes come to investigate. You can go in, Mr. Holmes. She's there. We didn't touch a thing. Oh, good. And the police left this area completely untouched, so we can totally examine it. So what is it? A packing case maker? It's, uh, it's not upstairs. It's not upstairs. It's in the backyard. That must be the victim. Annie Chapman is her name. It was very good of PC Chandler to let us pass. He said no one has touched the corpse. It's the perfect opportunity for us to put our skills to the test. Watson, let's not waste it. Watson's not that kind of doctor, though. He's not a mortician. He's a general practitioner, right? So let's examine stuff. Things. What do we have? Two combs, curiously arranged. Curious. There are no trails on the ground. There's no sign of a struggle. Yes, and that's a clue. Ooh, we have three pages of deduction to make here. Part of a paper. Hmm. A torn envelope. It smells of rubbing alcohol. It contains three pills. I will take one. Two should suffice for the police. I believe that's going to be another puzzle. Like, we're going to go back to Dr. Gibbons later on and have him identify that pill found at this crime scene. A piece of coarse muslin. The blood is a dozen inches or so from the ground. Blood stains on the wall. Mm, definitely a lot more violent than the previous murder. So, Doctor, shall we examine our victim? Ah, oh, I'm tired, Holmes. I'm not sure if I am in a state to do this work. Come, Watson, there is little time. Show me what you're made of. Oh, my God. Pray, Watson, pull yourself together. Can you establish the time of the crime? The extremities of the corpse are cold and rigor mortis is beginning to set in. I would say that the murder was committed over two hours ago before 4.30 a.m. All right. Uh, something here at the fence. What's this fence? This fence separates the courtyard from the neighbors, 27 Hanbury Street. There is going to be a witness who was there on the other side of the fence. Um, not, we won't get involved with that witness quite yet. This door must lead to the cellar. The latch has been recently repaired. Good. What else are we going to look at here? Let's see. Now, let's look at the stomach, or at least what remains of it. It's dreadful, Holmes. 
Who could do that to someone? That's what you're here for, Watson. Tell me what this man has done. The stomach has been entirely opened and... Oh, my God! A number of organs have been removed. So, you're telling me that the organs were removed, Watson. They weren't ripped out. Not at all, Holmes. On the contrary, this is clearly the work of an expert. I couldn't have done any better myself. And the uterus is missing. So perhaps the killer is a doctor. I mean, who else can remove organs with such surgical precision? Looky here. It would seem he has a mark on his left hand. Well, she has a mark on her hand. What's this? We want to magnify it. The victim must have worn a large ring or several little ones, and someone pulled them off forcefully. This detail will be very valuable, Watson. You can be sure of that. Yeah, you can see the ring left by the, uh, well, rings. And now let's look at the face. Let's look at this poor woman more closely. Let's see, throat slits. Look at her neck. What can you tell me? There are two incisions. Just like the previous murder. A bruise. The tongue is swollen. The victim's face appears to have bruising, wouldn't you say? Under the maxilla and cheek. There is less on the right side. My dear Watson, now that we have found all of our clues, nothing remains but to subject them to our most likely hypotheses in order to deduce the facts. All right. Let's to do some facts and then let's end this video. I... This is really gruesome. Okay, so there aren't footsteps or streaks of blood on the ground. The victim was not dragged over here. The victim wasn't killed and then dragged here later. So blood on the fence is off the ground. Blood on the wall and the stairs. Well, obviously she was killed while... Oh, I was going to say while standing up, but that's not the correct conclusion. She was killed while lying down? No. So she was alive. Okay, so she was alive, but she was lying down. And that's when she was killed. And that is the correct conclusion that, hey, the murder took place here. Victim has bruises under the right jawbone and beneath the left cheek. So we're, we're getting into the left hand, right hand stuff again. We had this with the first victim. So, the murderer held the, the victim's chin with the left hand, while slit the throat with his right hand. Kind of different, because previously it was choked with the right hand, slit with the left hand. This is just gross. Okay, so we're going to conclude that we have a right-handed killer in this particular case. Tongue is bloated, uh, strangled. Ah, new deduction here. So, she died of strangulation, partially strangled, and then, and then had her throat slit. Yeah, so she wasn't completely killed. The first victim was killed by strangulation and then was cut to pieces. This one was partially strangled and then cut to pieces. It's gross. The envelope is the, the victim's envelope. And we are concluding it just, uh, not that it fell during the murder, but she was like holding it in her hand when she was killed. So what was she doing then? People don't usually just hang around with envelopes at four in the morning. The items at the feet are very orderly. They must belong to the victim, right? And then we're going to conclude that... Not that she struggled greatly. Which one? The murderer searched her. And the murderer is just unfeeling and organized, did a very thorough search of these things which were in her pockets and put them in a pile right here. The comb, the other comb, and the envelope. The body is cold. Uh, the crime was committed just like two hours ago. So it was committed not after 4 a.m., uh, before 4 a.m. So rigor mortis apparently takes about two hours. That's what I'm drawing based on these conclusions. That's my conclusion from these conclusions. A large scrape on the first phalanx of the middle finger. So, victim had rings, and the murderer stole the rings, as Holmes kind of indicated. So 
So let's see, incision, all oh, incisions. What do those mean? Well, the murderer used a very sharp blade. Yeah, we, we kind of knew that already. So organs are missing. Clearly the murderer knows, let's see, a weapon of great size. And the murderer, let's see, uterus was removed and taken meaning the killer has a knowledge of anatomy. Those sound good. And now for our final deduction, the killer purposely wanted to decapitate her. I hear a noise coming from the street, Watson. The authorities are arriving. It's time for us to go. 